morning. Good morning. Welcome to Friday. My name is Christy Hegrenes. I'm the founder and executive director of Global Press Institute. Global Press Institute is an international not-for-profit organization that trains and employs women throughout the developing world to be professional investigative reporters. After completing a six-month-long intensive training program, Global Press Institute hires full-time the reporters that we have trained to go through our program. Because English is not a requirement for our program, our reporters go on to work with our editors, fact checkers, to produce in-depth ethical investigative news from their local communities. We work to saturate that news throughout their local communities, and then we translate that news into English, and we disseminate it via more than 80 syndication partners across the world. The result is that we are beginning to saturate the world's media markets with news, about the world's women, by the world's women. Now, it goes without saying that technology and technology training is a big part of teaching ordinary women throughout the developing world to become professional journalists. But bridging the digital divide isn't just about handing a woman a laptop or plopping her down in front of the internet. And that's what we're here to talk about today moving the concept of the digital divide forward and actually addressing the topic of digital justice. And we're really fortunate this morning to have two experts on the topic of digital justice and popular technology with us. Just to give you a brief outline of the way this morning's program will go, we will hear from each of our panelists some uh, details about their work and their thinking around digital uh, justice. And then we'll sit down and begin to have a conversation, not just around the problems uh, related to digital justice, but about some solutions. We want to have a conversation about tools and best practices so that we can all leave here today with a really concrete idea about how to move forward implementing digital justice into the work that we all do. So without further ado, let me present Virginia Eubanks. Good morning. Thanks so much. Um, it's really exciting to be here. I uh, love being in this room. There's so much great work that's going on and that you guys are talking about at this conference. So I'm really excited to be part of the conversation and um, especially excited to share the stage with, with um, Diana Nacera from the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition and Allied Media Projects who will talk about the work that's going on here in Detroit, uh, which is some of the most cutting edge innovative work that I've seen in, in all the work I've done around um, digital justice. So I'm incredibly excited to hear more about what they're working on these days too. But um, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about me. We all like to do that first thing in the morning. Um, so my name's Virginia Eubanks. Um, I came to my work in digital justice through a history of the Community Technology Center movement and the Community Media Movement. Um, but something that's important to understand about me too is that I sort of came of age as an anti-poverty economic justice activist in the mid-1990s in the Bay Area of California. And yeah, woo-ish, woo-ish. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna kind of tell you the story of how that made me a little schizophrenic and why the way that I do digital justice now is sort of comes out of the experiences I had in the Bay Area. So on one hand, I was sort of newly out of college. I had what at the time were considered cutting edge technology skills, right? Like I knew HTML. <gasps> I, the world has moved um, away from that as the cutting edge. Um, I haven't quite moved away from that as the cutting edge, but the world has. So at the time, I had some um, skills and some tools that were in demand. I uh, was involved and engaged in doing sort of contracting work for a number of different companies, Genentech and CNET and some other high-tech companies in the Bay Area. But what I was also doing is working in communities that primarily were um, low-income, poor and working-class communities, um, and I was doing uh, economic justice work. And so sort of half of my life would be um, going downtown to CNET and um, talking to people where I was working um, and all of them believed that the internet was going to create sort of a new perfect world, like a world that was, had um, great, transparent, accountable government, e-democracy, right, that would uh, sort of do away with all of the injustices of the past, 
racism, classism, sexism, um, and that was also gonna make everybody a million dollars. Um, <laughs> on, on the other hand, I would just leave my apartment in the morning and walk into San Francisco and realize that those kinds of changes weren't really what was happening on the ground in San Francisco. So what was happening in San Francisco is public housing was disappearing, rents were going up, um, and the, the, the vibrant, diverse community that was San Francisco was changing really rapidly. So one of the statistics I always use to talk about it is that the African American population of San Francisco in 2010 was half what it was in 1980, right? So on one hand, there was this rhetoric that was like, internet equals perfectly lovely equal world where diverse minds meet and mingle, um, you know, in, in cyberspace, and on the other hand, I was seeing physical space, the physical space I lived in, the community I lived in, changing in ways that really concerned me as a feminist social justice activist, right? This led me to be a little crazy, um, and I had sort of a crisis of conscience, and I ran away from the Bay Area. So in 1997, I sort of loaded up my like 1980 Volvo station wagon, and I drove across the country to this little town called Troy, New York, which is about 150 miles due north of New York City on the Hudson River. And I said, it's a little post-industrial city of about 50,000 people. And I was like, phew, I won't have to deal with that here, right? And so I go about my life. And literally maybe eight months after I moved to Troy, the sort of municipal fathers of the capital region said, we have a new economic, regional economic development plan and we're gonna call it Tech Valley. And it was explicitly based on San Francisco and Silicon Valley and Austin um, as models. So I had this moment where I was like, okay, there's something going on here. I need to figure it out because clearly anywhere I go, this thing's gonna follow me and make me crazy. So, um, so that's where I came to this work from. And um, I, I entered into this work in a really incredible, vibrant community of resourceful women um, who live at the YWCA of Troy Cohoes. Um, and that's us on your, on your right. Um, that's the, our design group. It's called WIMSIM, Women at the YWCA Making Social Movement. And the book that I wrote, which is called Digital Dead End, Fighting for Social Justice in the Information Age, is based on four years of participatory action research with the women who lived in the YWCA community. Um, and participatory action research basically just means you do research with people rather than on them, you know, treat them like thinking subjects rather than lab rats. Um, and so, uh, so the work took place in that context. And what, I, what I've been asked to do is talk a little bit about some of the misperceptions I had about technology and social justice when I entered this work. And then um, in the second half, I'll talk a little bit about the sort of tools and techniques we came up with um, to do that kind of work differently to move sort of the needle from talking about technology access to talking about digital justice. And so I'm gonna sort of set us up. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use myself as a sort of um, naive and slightly stupid person who started this work and, um, and tell you about how lucky I was to find the women in the Y community who sort of corrected my misperceptions. Um, so there's sort of three big misperceptions I made um, in starting this work. And they were based on this idea, um, which is the digital divide. Which you, are people familiar with the, the, that phrase? It's, it's, it's pretty common. So the idea, this is my sort of like sad, bad little cartoon drawing of the digital divide from um, 2003. Um, the idea behind the way we normally think of the digital divide is that um, there are folks who have access to technology resources, technology tools, and expertise. Um, who know stuff about technology and use it and have access to it. And then there's a groups of people who don't have those skills, those tools, those resources, those techniques. So the solution is either to chuck the technology and the expertise over this gap, that is the digital divide, or to somehow yank some small or large number of people from the have not side to the have side. Um, and that would create justice. So the assumption behind this framework of the digital divide is that poor and working people, um, and, and particularly poor and working women, um, are on, often on the have not side, right? That they don't have access to technology, they don't have access to technology skills, technology jobs, resources, and expertise. Um, and that's sort of the assumption I had when I went into the Y community, was like I had all of this background in technology, these were skills and resources that I could use to help folks who are struggling to meet their basic needs um, meet those needs. So imagine my surprise when I turned out to be completely wrong. 
utterly and completely wrong. So, um, and in three ways that I'll, I'll tell you really quickly. Um, first, I assumed that uh, high-tech skills would get women jobs um, that would support them in high-tech industries. Wrong. <laughs> In fact, two-thirds of the women that I spoke to in the um, YWCA community already had high-tech jobs, but those high-tech jobs were in low-wage high-tech work, like call centers, right? So they were working in call centers, they were working in data entry warehouses, there were no fewer than, in the 90 women who lived at the Y, no fewer than three COBOL programmers, right? Who still couldn't get work because their skills had um, fallen out of the times because they had had breaks in their employment um, history because of childbearing, because of fleeing domestic violence relationships, because of homelessness, for all of the reasons um, that people have breaks in their employment history. So it's not that people couldn't get these jobs, it's that the jobs that they had were low wage, unsupported, um, unsupportive of self-sufficiency, unsupportive of having children, and really an, an issue for um, foreign working women to um, maintain. So first misunderstanding, high tech skills will get you a high tech, uh, like a well paid high tech job, a self sufficient high tech job. Second misunderstanding was um, that if we, um, that the high tech economy itself would lift all boats, particularly that it would bring women up in terms of wages um, closer to men. Um, so the idea often when we talk about the high tech economy is that because it's brain work, not brawn work, that it um, opens up access to more sustainable economics for women. But, and this is a very complex chart, don't try to read it, I'll just tell you what it says. Um, and, and if you wanna read it, you feel free to buy the book. Um, sorry, that's the only plug I'll do, but, uh, well maybe one more at the end. But, um, uh, so what we found in Troy, um, and I think what is a really important unexam unexamined feminist issue in the high tech economy, is while women were getting closer to men within their racial and class categories, right? So where white middle class women were getting closer to white middle class men, that um, inequality was actually increasing among women by race and class, right? So say white women were getting closer, middle class white women were getting closer to middle class white men, but they're getting farther away from other women. They're getting farther away, middle class women were getting farther away from foreign working women, white women were getting farther away from black and Latino women, right? Um, so I think as people who do feminist social justice work, it's really important to be thinking about the injustices among us uh, rather than just the injustices between women and men. And um, that turns out to be really important in high tech economies. And it's not just, we found this happening in Troy, um, New York for sure, but that work's been confirmed by other people um, like Leslie McCall in other places. And final misunderstanding was we're coming back to this idea of um, electronic democracy, e-democracy. This idea that technology makes governance more transparent, more accountable. Um, well, one of the most important things that I learned in the YWCA community was the place where um, foreign working women in northeastern US um, most often come into contact with technology when they're not working in high tech work is in the public assistance office. Um, and so woman after woman after woman told me stories about um, coming into public assistance and the very first thing they saw being sort of the back of a computer screen, right? And a caseworker would be hiding behind the computer screen and would sort of type away and look around and say, you're not in the system, and sort of go back behind the computer screen, right? So sort of like in the Wizard of Oz, when they finally get to Oz and there's that big door and the little door and the guy with the mustache comes out and it's like, go away, right? Um, except for on the other side of that door is a solution to homelessness if you have no place to live, food for your kids, medical care if you're struggling um, uh, with a medical issue, right? Really, really life-saving um, uh, resources. And that technology has become the face of that system increasingly is a really important relationship that foreign working women in the United States have with technology. Um, and it's something that we need to take into account when we do this work, that people have had these experiences. Um, so for women in the YWCA community, this is what I call in the book sort of the real world of information technology. Um, rather than being technology poor, women in the Y community had a truly copious, extensive experience with technology in their work, in their homes, in their political life, and in their everyday sort of experiences. And this experience, I think, is an important challenge um, and a resource for technology equity and digital justice. 
Um, we came to understand that um, technology isn't a destiny, it's not um, a goal, but it is another site of struggle. Just like all of the other things we struggle around, economic justice, gay and lesbian liberation, civil rights, um, it is a social justice issue in its own right. Um, and so what we did at the Y is develop an approach that we called popular technology. And it's called popular technology because it's based on some of the insights of popular education. And the idea is that rather than um, teaching technology skills to people we sort of deemed technology deficient, people who don't have enough technology or don't get it, we um, realize that everyone is an expert in technology in their own everyday lives. So whether you've ever used Twitter or ever used electricity, you know a lot about how technology impacts your everyday life. So the idea of popular technology is to in gather everybody's insight into what it means to live in sort of the techno-social world we live in now. Um, and then to build engaged technology projects from there. So starting with the justice issues and moving to the technology tools rather than saying, oh, we have Twitter, what can we make it do, right? So it's really inverting the, I, the, the way that we often think about technology and social justice. And one of the best examples of people who do this kind of work on the ground, um, I think is the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition and Allied Media Project. So I'm gonna hand it over to Diana and Nocera to talk a little bit about their work. Um, excited to have you all here in Detroit. I hope you've had a good stay and had some time to actually go out and see the city. I'm sorry that the weather hasn't been that great, um, but I'm happy that you all are here to share this um, awesome city with me. Um, so first, I'm also gonna share my story of how I came into this work with you. Um, so my name is Diana Nucera and I'm the co-director of Allied Media Projects. I'm a member of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. I'm an artist and I'm a woman in technology. And I wear all these hats simultaneously as I speak to you because they have all shaped the perspectives of what I want to share with you today and all the ideas that we have at Allied Media Projects and in the Digital Justice Coalition. I am first an artist, um, and I say this because my experience as an artist has shaped my approach to creativity, education, and technology. And my journey here today starts from my experiences of growing up in rural Indiana, uh, where my family was one of four families of color and I was more of an outlier, more than an outlier, but I was, uh, I was basically unaccepted and not welcomed. Um, and so I became an artist as a act of survival. Um, and one thing that I, once I learned digital media and technology, um, then I began to create media. And one thing that I used to do in order to make friends was I used to have folks come over and do music videos with me in my living room at my home. And it totally worked. I have made great friends um, and I was really popular. I went from being very weird and geeky to being very sweet. Um, and those relationships that I formed, are, I, they still exist. So those relationships that I had when I was like, I think I was in like sixth grade or something. Whenever I go back home, we talk about those moments and that's such a touchstone for us. We, it's just, it, we learned so much about each other and what we cared about, how we thought when we created this, these music videos with each other. And thanks to YouTube, we often remind each other with <laughs> these silly <laughs> links, which I don't know sometimes if that's good or bad, but. Um, so then I became a technologist. The tools that I had to shape the media that I was making had limitations. Um, and it would, I would usually take disposable cameras and try to hack them together to make, I don't know, fancy things. I thought I was gonna be able to create this new camera. I wanted, I wanted access to making 3D videos. Um, and sometimes I would get really cool like double exposure shots. Um, but most of the time they didn't work at all. But in that process I was able to learn about technology and I, learned, I just learned so much. And that's what informed my education and my community organizing. And this is a photo, one of my photos, um, which is sort of a self-portrait and kind of something that I used to play around with. So I'm sharing this story with you because I believe that my story is an example of why people like me who have been forced to carve their own path should be in positions to shape the future. And I believe that digital justice assures that women like me have the opportunity to be in positions like you as well as myself. So I've come to learn in my journey 
that each woman holds a diverse set of experiences that shape their own story. And in order to have a holistic solution to economic and interpersonal struggles that each of these women may face, that we need to understand the full range of those diverse perspectives. And along with our efforts to bridge the digital divide, we need to foster relationships that bring these solutions to life. The relationship begins with telling the story, uh, telling our own stories so that other women have a chance to see who have similar experiences, to find solidarity in those stories, to find innovation, and to also find comfort in knowing that they are not alone. And so the work at Allied Media Projects begins by listening and in the Digital Justice Coalition. It begins by listening to the stories of our communities that we work with, and from there we build strategies for addressing the most pressing issues that we face. And Allied Media Projects cultivates media strategies for a more just and creative world. So from the unique intersection of media and communications, art and technology, education, entrepreneurship, and social justice, we share and develop models for transforming ourselves as well as our communities. So we use media-based organizing to collect and synthesize the stories around us. And media-based organizing is a process of speaking and listening as a community um, in order to investigate the problems that shape our realities. And then we begin to imagine new realities and work together to make them real. So when we use media in this way, we build new kinds of relationships, internally and interpersonally, with and within our communities. And we transform ourselves from consumers of information to producers, from objects within narratives of oppression to then authors of transform the transformation of the world. And we understand media as any way in which we communicate. It's not just about the internet or computers, but it's also about when we dance with each other how we do our design, from building technology, to building radio transmitters, to even building wireless mesh networks that allow for communities to own the way in which that they um, communicate with each other. It's also about making music and being able to share that music with folks and, and share those emotions that those mu that music holds. So we like to demystify technology, not only learning how to use it, but how to design it and to, with, to be useful within our own lives. So in doing so, we end up redefining technology and the role that it plays. And we understand our community as an ecosystem comprised of many interdependent organisms. And the five organisms that our community in which we focus are the education system, the economy, governance, infrastructure, and the story that is being told about our community. We believe that that story is where we have the ability to sort of reshape all of these other systems and where we have the most agency to reshape. So we see human relationships as the soil from which these organisms grow and strategies for addressing the problems within our ecosystem must consider the whole network of relationships that feed it and its existence. And at AMP, we focus on nourishing that soil. So we really look at how media and technology can build relationships um, and, and allow people to, to get to know each other, just how my experiences were when I was a kid and needed friends. Um, so imagine all the ways in which media and technology can transform our relationships and in turn transform our economy, our education system, and the way we organize. I've seen participant media projects um, that come out of our program go from a video and turn into a freelancing uh, business that they then do, and that that video that they've created then turn into discourse and dialogue uh, around food justice, around environmental justice within their, within their community. And that's an example of what community um, media-based organizing is. So, our story for how the work that we do um, in the Digital Justice Coalition begins in BTOP, um, which is the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program. So when, when it was announced that stimulus funding was announced in 2009, we saw this as an opportunity to answer the question of what role media and technology can be in restoring community and creating new economies. And so later that summer, Allied Media Projects convened a community meeting of stakeholders 
um, that wanted to continue building out this vision of what a healthy digital ecosystem can look like. And we founded ourselves as the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. And so the D D DDJC it, uh, made plans to pursue this DTOP funding. And so the coalition includes 13 member organizations representing seniors, youth, environmental justice, welfare rights activists, hip hop community organizers, tele technologists, and artists. And the one thing that threaded us all together is that communication is a fundamental human right. And that's something that we realized was very important in all the work that we did. So we developed the digital justice principles to guide our work. And I have some, some zines that I, that are, I believe might be, um, oh yes, oh they're up here. Um, and the digital justice principles are in that zine. And you could also go to our website to, to, download, um, to download them if you'd like. But I'm gonna share just a few of them with you because there's 13 in total. But I'll give you a taste of what, what some of them are. So digital justice advances our ability to tell our own stories as individuals as well as communities. Digital justice values non-digital forms of communication and fosters knowledge sharing across generations. Digital justice demystifies technology to the point where we can not only use it, but become creators of our own technology and participate in the decisions that will shape communication infrastructures. Digital justice provides spaces through which people can investigate community problems, generate solutions, and create media and organize together. And digital justice integrates media and technology and education in order to transform teaching and learning to value multiple learning styles and to expand the process of learning beyond the classroom and across the lifespan. So in developing these principles, we saw similarities to the harm caused by polluting industries and the harm caused by corporate media to our mental and physical environments. And we saw parallels um, between the benefits of healthy local information systems and the food systems. So we wanted to design learning environments that would allow us to engage with technology in a community context, rather than as an isolated individuals on computers. And so similar to the benefits of a community garden versus as an individual garden, we believe that collaborative learning environment would not just teach skills, but also grow relationships. And thus the discotheque was born, <laughs> which as, is as exciting as it sounds. Um, discotheque is short for discovering technology. And the um, literature that I have um, here is um, it's a how-to guide on how to do it. Uh, but they're community media sort of science fairs where you, what we do is we like go in and investigate what is it that so, some of the problems that you all have and what type of technology do you want to learn and then who knows what. Um, and then people have like stations and um, they teach each other how to use different tools. Um, so instead of teaching the basic skills like di of digital literacy to use the internet or technologies as they are, we taught the range of more advanced skills so people can then change the internet and use technology in the ways that they need it. Um, and we learned that, you know, when you encourage the production of information, rather than the consumption of it, it opens up room for new experts to emerge. And so we saw that we had, when oftentimes we think of um, maybe our seniors as not being very digital savvy, that they actually had really amazing ideas as to how the internet should be used to be in, keep in contact with their families, as well as safety um, within their communities. And we also found that like young people were using beat making and making music to then share, just like, be able to express their ideas because that was easier for them to communicate to elders than it was because for to just speak with them because there was like some ageism happening there. So digital media had like this, uh, they were able to sort of share each other's skills and then like also like even out this playing field across the generations. So they're really fun and we encourage you to do it. Um, <coughs> so discotheques were so successful that we were asked to then make a how-to guide. And within the how-to guide, it has like the political context of, and the educational context, as well as some theories behind it. Um, and also in the back, there are some modules of, um, in case you wanted to 
that don't know what type of media or technology uh, to teach, there are some, some station modules in the back. And it has a very, uh, kind of a, a how we organized it, but we realized that like in every, every city that's different and the needs that you have are different, um, but they're just some guidelines of how to organize it. And so can you just lift up the, so they're purple, and if you'd like one, uh, they'd be in the front row here. <coughs> um, so we use the stories that we heard and the needs that were expressed at these discotheques to apply for the BTOP funding that I mentioned before that was available. And our application was successful. And in the fall of 2010, our coalition was awarded a $1.8 million signal. Um, and my organization, Allied Media Projects, <coughs> was then empowered by the Digital Justice Coalition to launch programs that totaled about half of that grant. And <coughs> we used, we then collaborated with East Michigan Environmental Council and Open Technology Institute to then carry out the visions that were sort of shaped and that, that came out of these discotheques. So the discotheques were a huge, played a huge part in, in shaping these programs, as well as this application to receive this money. And so what we did is we created um, the two programs that Allied Media Projects did, which I'm briefly going to go into, um, where it was out, um, the Detroit Future Media Program, which is a, um, a d media intensive that where participants learn digital media skills and video, audio graphics, web design, and IT networking. <coughs> and then they learn how to apply these skills in one of three concentrations, education, entrepreneurship, and community organizing. So that's where we're trying to like really tap into the full ecosystem that we work with. And the program is accessible to a wide range because we're using popular technology techniques um, and popular education techniques. So we have students ranging from 17 to 77 and they're all learning together. And we learned how to do that also through these disco techs. And it's very challenging to, to, uh, to teach a, a wide range of students that way, but we've learned that the peer-to-peer -peer education that happens there is really amazing. And that the network that it ends up developing from those exchanges is really solid and very strong. Um, so we wanna look at technology education not by like you have this skill and this is your level and so you all need to go into one place, but to be like, okay, we are here to learn all of this together and if I'm an expert in one particular thing, then someone else is also an expert. Um, so here's an example of the students. Um, we also have Detroit Future Schools, which is um, taking students from the um, program and then integrating them into the, the classrooms and teaching um, media-based uh, curriculum with the teachers. And here's to our, our artists are paired up with teachers and they're uh, teaching teachers then how to use digital media. Okay, and this is where I will wrap it up. Um, so all of the work at Allied Media Projects and the Digital Justice Coalition comes from understanding uh, the stories that have been most marginalized carry out the knowledge that we need to bring fundamental social and economic transformation. We also need new kinds of relationships. For us, digital justice is the process of using media and technology to build these relationships. And this work happens over several years. And it involves taking risks and prioritizing things that are hard to measure. And if we take those risks and invest in those relationships, we have the potential to shape the future of our economic system, our governance systems, and our education system. And the infrastructure that make up all of our individual ecosystems. So we need the stories of all the women in our communities to shape how we organize and what we prioritize. And with that said, if you're interested in learning more, I didn't speak about the Allied Media Conference, which is the longest running program that Allied Media uh, Projects does, but it happens in June of this year at Wayne State University, and I invite you to come back to Detroit to learn more about media and technology and the role that it can play in transforming the world around us. Thank you. So we want to just take the last couple of minutes here. Uh, Diane did a great job telling us about some tools like discotheques that we can use to actually start to explore 
digital justice in our work, but we want to also talk about what is the impact, right? So Virginia, my question for you is, in addition to maybe some tools of your own that you want to share, what does the future look like when if digital justice is employed by uh, folks in this room who begin to prioritize it? So I, I'm really pleased that um, Diana uh, ended with this, how important storytelling is, because it's been really, really important to our work as well. And um, I want to take one minute to introduce people to a couple of projects, because I think in the end, um, what makes this work so successful is being able to tell our own stories, but doing that within the context of a vibrant, vigorous, diverse social movement that supports the kind of change that we want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I just, if I can show you a quick slide, um, one of the projects that we've been working on as um, an organization that came out of this work called Our Knowledge, Our Power um, is using the economic human rights framework to help women tell the stories of how their economic human rights um, have been violated in their communities. We've done that in two different ways. Um, the first is through these little zines um, that talk about different kinds of economic human rights violations. Um, the two that you see there, one of them is about um, healthcare on the left and the other is about um, housing. Um, and we've recognized that actually using paper is really useful when you're organizing on the ground in your geographic community. But we've also used um, uh, video to communicate with a broader um, group of social justice organizations under the coali a coalition that's called PPERC, or the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And the reason I want to bring this up is this is something that people in this room can get directly involved in if, um, if they choose to. Um, the World Courts of Women is a series of, um, yay for the World Courts of Women, <laughs> um, is a, a series of sort of uh, they're a bit like the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa. Um, the ones in the United States are around poverty. Um, and there's been 40 World Courts of Women around the world in the last decade or so. The very first one in the United States happened in Oakland this past summer. Um, and there'll be three more. Uh, there'll be the regional, so there's one in the South. There's one in Detroit, actually, sometime in the next year being organized by the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. And then there's a national in Philadelphia in October, October 18th through 20th, which is being organized by the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And basically the um, World Courts of Women are places that women come tell their stories of resistance and survival in front of um, a panel of international observers who then write recommendations uh, to hold the United States accountable for its crimes against the humanity of the poor in this country. Um, and this is really exciting work. So yay, um, yay for that. I, I'd love to see people get in, involved in that work because I think it's so important for us to tell our stories to recognize we have more in common than we thought, but it's also really important to do that within a network that can amplify those stories. And I think that's what the World Courts of Women does. Absolutely, absolutely. Unfortunately, we have no time for Q&A, but I encourage you guys to find Diana, find Virginia, and talk with them because they are truly some of the foremost thinkers on these topics of digital justice. So. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.